Hi, everybody. It's John Callen from the Doobie Brothers. You're watching for Bass Players Only with John Liebman. Thank you for being here. Hi, and welcome to fourbassplayersonly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for bassplayersonly.com for people over 50 who want to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For bassplayersonly.com, that's what we're all about. We've got a great guest this week. I've been excited. I've been looking forward to getting together with John Cowan. You may have seen John with the Doobie Brothers. He's also a solo artist. He's performed and or recorded with darn near everybody from Garth Brooks, Glenn Campbell, Roseanne Cash, Steve Earle, Allison Krauss, Reba McIntyre, Leon Russell, Poco, John Prine, Kenny Rogers, Ricky Skaggs, Travis Tritt, Hank Williams Jr., Winona, Zach Brown, and who knows how many others. Welcome, John. It's so good to see you again. It's good to be here with you, John, always. Well, the last time we did an interview, it was published on August 19th, 2016. And I, I don't want to start out on downer, but we, uh, at the time of this recording, we all just heard the news about Michael Rhodes. And I know you had a close personal connection with him. I've interviewed him. He was a great guy. Uh, why don't we start there? Because I know that we're all thinking about it and there's a lot going on down where you are in Nashville. So how do you think he should be remembered? Uh, well, he was a prince of a human to begin with. He was a gentle, brilliant soul with a wicked sense of humor. Um, and I met Michael when he first moved up here um, with not his brother, Danny Rhodes, but his, com his companion, Danny Rhodes. And they started a band in Nashville called The Nerve. This must have been 83, maybe. So I have met Michael... When he first moved to town, I had just moved to Nashville in 80. And he was the guy that you went to see, you know, if you were a musician in Nashville. And, um, yeah, you got to see Michael Rhodes. Same with Edgar Meyer when Edgar Meyer moved to Nashville. You know, our town is full of amazing bassists. It's just, you know, it's just crazy, really. We could go on for the next half hour if I could remember everybody about bass players in Nashville. But Michael, I don't know what, you know, he had that thing that's indescribable, unfortunately. Pocket, groove, taste, innovation, introspection. Um, he was such a mature musician. He just really was when it came to the bass. Um, he knew what to do, when to do it. And, and he also led, it's funny, I was, having a conversation with my friend Tom Britt yesterday, and they both played with Vince Gill. And what Tom was saying is, you know, when you play with Michael, he kind of directs the flow and the groove of things. And uh, it used to, frust apparently it frustrated Vince occasionally because he likes to take long guitar solos. And, <laughs> and he said that Vince would come over occasionally and say to Michael, could you just go da-da-da-da-da in this section? <laughs> <laughs> anyways that i don't think it was overplaying i think if michael was just a leader it's uh it's funny being a rhythm instrument in a in a combination of musicians but the direction it's kind of like you you wanted to go where michael went if that makes any sense i know there's lots of bass players listening to this but he was just he he was just a brilliant guy he was just brilliant in so many ways he was smart as a whip and well educated and very worldly but more than anything he was just this really gentle guy you know you could always whenever I saw him you know he would just hug me and we'd smile and we'd tell jokes and so it's a great loss for the for the community of Nashville and for the music community in general he's played on so many amazing records in the course of his life Pretty hard not to like him, you know? Yeah. He yeah. came through Detroit a few years ago with Joe Bonamassa. Yeah. We got together and, uh, yeah, we really enjoyed hanging out with him. Thank goodness we have all those recordings. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about you. It's been a few years since we got together. The uh, Your most recent album at the time, I know it came out a couple of years before we got together, but that was the uh, the most current one. That was 60. Yeah, which would have been nine years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's all good. So bring us up to date on what's been keeping you busy lately. Well, our schedule with the Doobies keeps me really busy. Uh, it seems like we have kind of settled into a groove now where we we seem to work work really hard from March till October. Then we're then we're home, which is really great. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Um, and so what I do is I I have two different uh, projects that I've worked with on the road and some locally. One is a band called the Herculeons with my friend uh, Andrea Zahn. Andrea is an amazing singer and she sings and plays violin and fiddle in James Taylor's band. I think she's been with James about 18 years. Um, and then I have a thing called the Newgrass All-Stars and it basically, it revisits all the music from my tenure in the Newgrass Revival, which was from 1974 to 1990. And, and we were actually inducted two years ago, we being the New Grass Revival into the Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame. So that was quite an honor for me to be. Congratulations. I know we touched on it a little bit, but in case anybody doesn't know, what exactly is New Grass? You know, what we did in that band to me is very similar to what the Allman Brothers did to blues. It was, um, you know, we were guys in our 20s that had grown up with the Beatles and listen to Miles Davis and listen to Frank Zappa and John Luke Pawnee and the Mahavishnu Orchestra and the Grateful Dead. And um, it was just younger guys taking a traditional art form and putting a contemporary spin on it. I mean, we did, I mean, the band consisted of mandolin, fiddle, which Sam Bush played, banjo, which Bela Fleck was the banjo player. Pat Flynn on acoustic guitar and myself on electric bass. And we, you know, we did Marvin Gaye songs and we did Bob Marley songs and we did Leon Russell songs. And we had our own repertoire that, of music that we had written ourselves. So uh, especially when Bela came in the band, it really, it, you know, he's such a phenomenal musician that it, it really upped our game a hundred percent. So so that's that's what newgrass is, and it's kind of interesting because now it is actually a subgenre of music called newgrass, which is feels pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about playing bass and singing. You're not just a bass player who sings. You you are really into the singing, I think, as much as you are the bass playing. And those are two things I was never really comfortable doing at the same time. And I wonder if you could comment on that are you thinking about both all the time or are you thinking more about one or the other how do you reconcile well, when, when you do them at the same time you know your your plate's pretty full so you have to you got to do both and bass is a rhythm instrument and it, it can be you know depending on how syncopated the music is sometimes it can be a lot it's a bit of this you know rubbing your head and patting your belly at the same time and stuff like that, that I've encountered over the years. It's for instance, I'll take a doobie song, for instance, which is singing the choruses on black water. It's no easy task. Yeah. Um, and I learned from the best. I learned from Paul McCartney and Peter Cetera and Jack Bruce and um, Getty Lee. And the list goes on sting um, the, all the great singing bass players. I've just got to say, I've got an interview with every one of those guys right here on ForBassPlayersOnly.com. So I, I just had to throw that in. Everyone. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely a job. And it's it, to be honest with you, it's, I think it's one of the reasons I've been able to keep working my whole life is, you know, you cut down on one band member if you hire a bass player that can sing really well. <laughs> you don't yeah. have to hire another singer. <laughs> it's true. So it makes for lots, it's made for lots of work for me. Um, and um, it's funny because uh, I think that I'm known as a vocalist as much or even more than I am as a bassist, even though I do both. So, yeah, I, th I think there was a time when Will Lee was getting a lot more work as a singer than as a. He's bassist. another. He's another amazing example. 
it's you know, well, we could go down. I, I have to really start thinking about this, but it's a really unique job. And I think only those of us that do it have an understanding of what that's like. I really do. Um, if you just play bass and sing background a couple times, and it's it's a different life, is all I can tell you. Um, because you're, you know, and I'm not even sure how the human brain accomplishes this, to be honest, because I've been, found myself many times in my life singing lead on a song, playing bass, and thinking about something else. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. <laughs> It's it's it astounds me what the human brain is capable of more than we can even imagine. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I was in Miami for six years. I was very very deeply entrenched into the Latin music scene, and we used to travel all around Central America, South America, you know, the Caribbean. So I did those background vocals, but in Spanish. So oh, there's right. there's another twist. <laughs> there you go. Something else to think about. There's another layer. That's right. Let's talk about playing bass and learning bass. For bass players only is uh, it's a bass instruction site and I've got sure. people coming from almost every state in the US and 50 some countries worldwide coming to for bass players only every day to learn how to play bass. And most of the people that come are men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. We do get some women but mostly men. And they're not trying to make a career out of it. They just, they have some time. They want to play bass and they want to get together with their buddies, maybe play some classic rock riffs or some blues shuffles or maybe some walking bass or, you know, just, just to have fun. And a lot of times talking about things that, that get layered on things that get layered on might be uh, arthritis, <laughs> tendonitis, those types of things. And I, I just say that to, to paint a picture to give you a context so i want to ask you in that context what advice you have for somebody like that who wants to learn to play bass what should they be thinking about what do you think is important for them to know i think it's important for them to identify music that really speaks to them it could be punk it could be latin it could be jazz it could be rock uh I think th that always appears if you're seeking something like that. I know for myself, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the golden age of pop and AM radio. So I remember buying Knock on Wood by Eddie Floyd. And I think it was on Stacks. I'm pretty sure it was on Stacks. But I remember putting the 45 on. And I had been playing a little bit. And trying to learn Duck Dunn's bass part on Knock on Wood, uh, which was no easy task. But that's what that's what I did. I, I was I was drawn to the bass for mostly because I started in a little neighborhood band, and nobody was. We, there was there was a drummer and a guitar player, and there's like, I guess you're playing bass. <laughs> so <laughs> so I did. Um, but the music had spoken to me before I put a bass, an instrument in my hand. And I think that if you're starting out, I think that's a pretty organic process, you know, uh, and getting a teacher is great. I had a teacher. I still take voice lessons. I'm 69 years old. So always having the help of a teacher or professional is, is, is a great idea. Good. Part of the service that you offer here. So, absolutely. Do you ever see people doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and you're thinking, "Boy, if I, if only I could just tell him to do this or not to do this." Are there any habits that, that you think are all too easy to fall into that might be just as easy to avoid? Boy, I, I you know, it's a really curious thing. I. I'm kind of the other opinion. Now, if you're doing something that's physically harming to you, if your body is in a position that's not good, you know, I have neck issues I have for since 1999. So I have to really, I'm playing lighter instruments. I'm um, playing much lighter than, I think my 62 jazz might weigh about seven or eight pounds. And I'm, I'm playing instruments now that weigh about five, four or five pounds. Um, and I think that 
something to think about if you're starting and you're you're over the age of 30 or 40 or 50. Um, you know, sitting upright in a chair when you play is is really smart. You don't want to be like this if you can keep from it. Um, but it's funny to me, some of the, my favorite bass players are guys that look spastic when they play. Um, Rick Danko just looked like, what are you doing? But if you listen to what he's playing, it's so beautiful. It's like he was, and he plays, he was playing fretless and singing all the time in the band. Um, another guy is Joey. What's Joey's last name with NRBQ? It's not Spompanato, is it? It might be. Same thing. But I see people a lot of times that that, that actually is their style. It's, they've just incorporated their being, their human being, as it were, into what they do when they play. And sometimes it, you know, not everybody looks graceful playing. Now, Michael Rhodes, there's a good example. This big, tall guy and his hands... Like Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton has the most beautiful hands. And when you watch him play, just the look of his Eric's fingers on the fretboard is so beautiful. Michael had that. Uh, Michael Rhodes, his right hand um, and his left hand, the placement. It was just a, a thing of beauty to watch his hands. And I always admire people like that, guys that play upright, you know. Um, it's just such a beautiful thing. You know, and then sometimes you see guys playing upright and it just looks like, what in the hell are you doing? But the sound that's coming out is is amazing. So who knows, you know? Yeah. There is a guy that I know I've interviewed a couple of times. His name is Randy Kurtz, Dr. Randall Kurtz. And he is a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, and a bass player. Ah. He's got all three. So he is very active, very involved in pain management he talks about victor wooten and some others and and how if you look really closely they modified what would be the traditional form for a technique and we're we're built kind of the same but we're not all built exactly the same no. so sometimes we have to make these adjustments and awareness was uh, was what he said was key the most important thing and yeah if it hurts then your body's trying to tell you something so i mean i always the the one of the most beautiful examples of dexterity and limitations is Django Reinhardt. He uh, had yeah. two and a third fingers. And to this day, you know, I don't, there's certainly been many people come down through the ages that played guitar in a, an, an amazing way. But I still, when you listen to Django, it's like, what the hell? How did he do that? I mean, he, he really only had two fingers. So, James Jamerson had all of his fingers, but he still only used one. And some right. of the stuff that came out of that is unbelievable. Crazy, isn't it? He went back and forth, right? Oh, I don't know he, about that. Well, when you say one, he only used one to pluck, right? Yeah, but you're asking if he did almost like what we'd call a double thumbing concept. with you'd almost up, have to. With, but with his you'd, finger. You'd almost have to to place eighth or sixteenth notes. I don't know. I don't know. Mingus did a lot pretty fast with just one finger also on the upright. So I don't I love know. How, I love how Sting has gotten this thing. It's almost like a banjo roll, a three finger banjo roll that he does. It's beautiful to watch. And he's, you know, the way he, he's got his bass up higher on his body. It's just a beautiful thing. I don't know if that came from him playing gut string guitar. I don't know, but it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Then we can get into the whole Billy Sheehan three finger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you reminded me of something that's got nothing to do with anything. But when you said 45s earlier, when, when you were a kid or at any point, did you ever have a 45 and you put it on, on a you know, turntable, but you didn't have a 45 adapter? So you had to try to put it just right down on the. <laughs> well, you could put, I, I remember like you could stack quarters on it and stuff like that. There was ways to get around it. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in forever. Uh, tell me a little bit about your gear. I have switched my friend and his instruments are pretty, pretty well known now. His name is John Scott and he, it's called Bluesman Vintage. Oh, yeah. a lot of people playing them. Isn't that down in Nashville? If it's I'm in not. Spring Hill, Tennessee. 
Okay. Yeah. And they're, they're beautiful instruments. And most of them are made to look vintage. So that's not so important to me. Um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the wood that they use that's so super light. It's, it's lighter than swamp ash. And that's the main reason I'm using. But they're also really well made. They're just, they're just jazz basses. They're passive. You know, I was using the active basses um, my first eight years with the doobies, I think, because we had a front of house guy that was kind of particular about that kind of stuff. And I actually prefer passive instruments, passive basses. Um, I understand why people play active ones, um, but I'm using passive. And that one is a one is a P bass and one is a jazz bass. With active, if something doesn't sound right, first thing is, is it the battery? Is it the battery you know, passive? You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> they're just a little, I don't, they're just, I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. And uh, I, <laughs> I think you said you were a long time D'Addario strings person. Yeah, I've, I'm still doing D'Addario some, but actually uh, I've switched because I've been playing flat wounds now for about 15 years and I'm using the labella oh. low tension. I really like how they feel. Um, and those are flats. And I've started using an amp on stage just for ambience, you know, because we have ears. I don't really even need it. It's kind of just me being spoiled a little bit. I mean, you can feel it because I stand right in front of it. It's an 810 cabinet. Um, anyways, I don't know if that answered your questions or not. Yeah, sure. Because last time you said, well, we, we only use in ears. We don't have a back. We, we don't have a, a traditional back line. Right. Isn't it uh, isn't it interesting that the names uh, Duck Dunn, James Jamerson, and Labella Flatwounds will all made their way into the conversation? <laughs> now for I, it's funny because they met. I think they're called. They were called the James Jamerson set for a while. The flats, the Labella flats, and I believe the E string was a one ten. They're big, big cables. Wow, and um. They sound amazing, but they create a lot of tension. And um, I decided maybe that's not such a good idea for my 62 jazz bass. I went to a light. I went to less tension, you know, trying to go easy on the old girl. <laughs> what about the future? I know you've got a lot coming up with the Doobie Brothers that you mentioned and the other projects and the new grass stuff. Anything else that you haven't mentioned that's coming up in the foreseeable future? Well, I'm, it's, once again, I have the, I have the luxury of, of doing, of being a singer, whether I play bass or not. So I'm, <clears throat> I've started work on a project with Mark. Do you know Mark Fain, upright bass player from Nashville? I don't. He's with Skaggs forever. Now he's playing with, with Ry Cooter a lot and all I sorts of people. Haven't heard that name in a while. Yeah. And he's a wonderful bassist, wonderful upright bassist. And um, he and I have been have started on a thing where so far I've just been singing on it. So I sometimes I just do projects where I'm just singing. And this is one of those so far. We're just barely into it. We we've just gotten one song recorded. So I never know what's around the bend. I just always try to be open for whatever uh the great spirit sending my way. <laughs> That's great. Not all bad. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. Oh, that's a good question. I have no idea. I can't, I because I can't, I've done this so long, you know, I'm going to be 70 in August and I started when I was 14. So, I gosh, I can't, I mean, I love sports. I played football in high school, but I quickly realized when I started playing music that I could either sec sit on the bench during a game or stand in front of a bunch of girls and sing. So that was pretty easy. I hung my cleats up. <laughs> <laughs> what position did you play? Center. Really? Okay. Yeah. I still love football. Yeah. Well, me too. All right. Well, this is great. Let's not wait another what what we've decided seven years or so. I hope we'll see each other uh, soon again in person. I think the world is kind of back to normal. You know, we're seemingly, yeah, seemingly, yeah. At least we're all working again. Thank God.
Yeah, that's great. And we're going out in public, but we still all need to be careful. So just common sense, everybody. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate it. Much luck and continued success to you. And uh, until our paths cross again, be well and stay safe, my friend. You too, John. It's always so great to see you and talk to you. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for people over 50 who want to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, that's what we're all about. Thanks again to our special guest this week, John Cowan. I will see you all next week. In the meantime, let's play bass. 